Greetings again and welcome to part six in our Last Day Events Explained podcast series. Today we are going to be talking about the latter rain and the loud cry. And I'm very happy to be sharing on this particular topic today. It's such an important topic for us as God's people. Before we get into that, we are going to cover some of our questions And again, some good questions are coming in, and there's so many that we will have a session at the end just to deal with as many questions as possible. There's a couple of points that I want to cover today before we get into the presentation. I continue to get questions about stage two of the Sunday Law. We had the presentation about the four stages of the Sunday Law, and more than one person has expressed concern about what would be wrong about worshiping on Sunday in addition to Sabbath, which is what stage two is like. If you'll recall, stage two is when Sunday worship becomes compulsory, when you are required to honor Sunday. I'm not saying that going to church on Sunday now is receiving the mark of the beast. If you go to church on Sunday now to visit a friend or something of that nature, that's not receiving the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is when Sunday worship is enforced and you are required by law to be in attendance to honor that day. If you go along with it at that point, that is receiving the mark of the beast. So I want to be clear on that. Yes, Ellen White makes the statement that we can hold services on Sundays, but that's prior to Sunday worship being enforced. So remember that. Ellen White's statement about holding services on Sunday is prior to Sunday worship being enforced. Once it becomes enforced and you are required by law to honor that day, that is the mark of the beast, and you need to be very clear on that. And that's when we as God's people will give the warning message. There was another question that came in about the seven heads of Revelation 17. I had mentioned briefly that the fifth head was the papacy, the sixth head was the United States of America, and the seventh head were the kings of the earth, the ten horns, which represent one kingdom at the end. And I didn't mention the first four heads, which is a good point, so I'll go ahead and mention them now. And if you look in Daniel and Revelation, the first kingdom of prophetic significance from Daniel 2 to the end of the world is the kingdom of Babylon. So the first head is Babylon, the second head is Medo-Persia, the third head is Greece, the fourth head is pagan Rome, then the fifth head is papal Rome, the sixth head is the United States of America, the seventh head is the one world government, and then the eighth, which is of the seven, is the papacy after the resurrection, after the deadly wound is healed, so to speak. And so that's my position on the seven heads. Good question. And again, there have been other questions that have come in. There was one question in particular about uh, a person asking, what do I do when I have a family member who refuses to leave the city and I know that they need to move to the country? You know, that can be a complicated situation. Again, you want to make sure that you follow something in a responsible manner and don't just make a quick snapshot decision that gets someone out of the city with no clear plan. You want to have a clear plan that the person can be able to support themselves and to be in a safe environment where they can support themselves and that you can support them if necessary. And so let God lead, pray for them, continue to share counsel with them and um, see if they're willing to talk to spiritual people that would encourage them to make that move if they're not willing to listen to you. Sometimes they'll listen to somebody else. So keep that in mind. Great questions. We'll address more next week. And again, we'll, if your question hasn't been answered, I will do my best to get to it in a special session at the end. One other thing before we get into the presentation, again, I want to remind you of my book on Daniel, Daniel Practical Living in the Judgment Hour. With everything that's happening in the world right now, now would be a great time to be studying prophecy if you're not familiar with the prophecy. And if you know someone that would benefit from studying these things, feel free to get a copy for them. You can get this from remnantpublications.com. So at this time, I am going to offer a word of prayer and ask the Lord to guide us through our presentation today. So let's bow our heads as we start this presentation. Father in heaven, we thank you for what you have been doing through this series of meetings Thank you that you are reminding us of the necessity of preparation for the last days. And Lord, I pray that we would be found ready and faithful. 
that we would be ready for the outpouring of the latter rain and for the giving of the loud cry. So guide me now as we go through this presentation. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to go ahead and get into our presentation for today, which is the latter rain and the loud cry. You know, the latter rain is what we as Seventh-day Adventists have been waiting for in the giving of the loud cry. This is the experience that we as a church are looking for. And so what is it going to take for the latter rain to be poured out? What is it going to take for us to be able to give the loud cry? And so I want to start off by reading um, a couple of statements. And we're going to start with the early rain experience in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So we're starting here in Scripture, Acts chapter 2, um, beginning in verse 1. And this is a familiar experience of the apostles after Jesus ascended to heaven. And Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And this is a description of the early reign experience when the apostles, the disciples, were filled with the Holy Spirit. And Ellen White says in Testimonies, Volume 8, page 21, the outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the former reign, and glorious was the result, but the latter reign will be more abundant. Now, when you think about what happened to the apostles, they took the gospel to the then known world in their generation through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God's people in the last days will do the same thing, and the latter reign will be even more abundant. Now, the early reign experience, it was not just for the apostles. It's also the experience we are to have. This is the experience of conversion on a daily basis. And notice the statement from Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers on pages 507 and 509. At no point in our experience can we dispense with the assistance of that which enables us to make the first start. The blessings received under the former reign are needful to us to the end. So we need that former rain, early rain experience. And then it says, as we seek God for the Holy Spirit, it will work in us meekness, humbleness of mind, a conscious dependence upon God for the perfecting latter rain. So we need the early rain experience, which is the fruits of the Spirit, having the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives, so that we can be developed for the receiving of the latter rain. Now, I want to take you to a few key Bible passages that talk about what we as God's people should be doing and how we should be preparing for the outpouring of the latter rain. And these verses are probably familiar to many of you. Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1. And this verse makes it very clear. Don't expect the latter rain to be poured out upon you if you aren't asking for it. Zechariah 10, verse 1 says, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. So God is saying here, if you want to receive the latter rain, ask for the this rain. Ask for the latter rain in your lives. And remember, this is the experience that we're going to need to face the final crisis of Earth's history. And so that's why we're talking about the latter rain and the loud cry today, is because how are we going to stand through this crisis? How are we going to be ready and able to handle the momentous events that bring this world's history to an end? And the only way is to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So we need to be praying for the outpouring of the latter rain. Now, the question could be asked, are there reasons, perhaps, why the latter rain has not been poured out? Now, Jeremiah chapter 3, this is a tough passage to stomach, but it's a passage that each one of us needs to listen to as God's people. Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Notice what the prophet Jeremiah says. Now, this was speaking to the 
the, uh, to the nation, the Jewish nation, the, the, G, the kingdom of Judah, just before they were taken into captivity in Babylon. And well might this be said to modern Israel as Babylon is trying to overtake God's people just before the end of the world. Notice this passage, Jeremiah 3, 1 to 3. They say if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But... Thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. God is saying, you know, if a man put his wife away and she goes to another man, you don't go back to that woman. That's polluted territory. And God is saying, but that's what you've been like to me. You've been like the one who has played the harlot with many lovers, but I'll take you back anyway, is what God is saying. But then notice this, verse 2, Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been lying with. In the ways hast thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. God is saying to his people, he's saying to us, look at the high places in your lives, which is where the idols were found in the times of old, but the high places in our lives today. Look at the television programs that you've been watching. Look at the things that you've been watching on the internet. Look at how you spend your time. Look at your career. Look at your life's path. And you think that you're on your way to heaven? You've actually put God into the background and made this world your idol and the things of this world your idol. And yet return to me, says the Lord. Then verse 3, therefore, so because you have been playing with the harlotry and the idolatry of this modern world, notice what God says in verse 3, therefore, the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. And thou hast a whore's forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. You know, Jesus says to the Laodicean church, um, you need the garment of my righteousness to cover the shame of your nakedness. And yet the church refuses to be ashamed. We're the Laodicean church, lukewarm, but we think we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And we refuse to be ashamed by our spiritual nakedness, thinking that idolatry is okay, leading up to the borders of Canaan, because everybody in the church is participating in idolatry as well. And God is saying the latter rain has been withheld because of your idolatry, but he is saying, return unto me. Pray for rain in the time of the latter rain. And if you repent and turn from your idols, God will pour out his latter rain blessing upon each one of us. That's an amazing passage. It's not a sermon that you'll hear preached in Seventh-day Adventist churches very often because most Seventh-day Adventists would be deeply offended if they were told they were playing the part of the harlot or that they had a whore's forehead. That's just the way it is. We would be deeply offended. Yet that's what God is saying to us. He's saying the latter rain has been withheld because you're playing the part of a harlot. You're supposed to be my bride, but instead you've been a harlot or a whore to the, to the idols of this world. And that's not easy to take. But God in his love is telling us that's who we are. And if we will receive that message and repent and obey God and receive purification from him, we can receive the outpouring of the latter rain. Now, Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and 20 adds some further information that is helpful for us. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, this tells us the timing of the latter rain in the progression of last day events. Acts chapter 3, 19 and 20, repent ye therefore. So see, repentance is a key part of this message. Repent ye therefore and be converted. So the church has been unconverted. It's been connected to idolatry and playing the part of a harlot. And God says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now that's the outpouring of the latter rain. And then it says, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. That's the second coming. So here's the sequence of, of events. We as a church have played the part of a harlot. And so God says, repent ye therefore and be converted. We need conversion. 
And then what happens? Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Now the blotting out of sin takes place in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary at the final atonement when probation closes. So repent ye therefore and be converted. And actually probation closes just shortly after that, just to be precise. But the blotting out of sin takes place with the outpouring of the latter rain. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So that's the outpouring of the latter rain. And then the, the blotting out of sin and the outpouring of the latter rain are synonymous, and then probation closes shortly after that, and then Jesus comes. That's the sequence of events. And so then Jesus comes. So what we need is to repent. That's a message that is often missing in churches today. People aren't told to put away their jewelry or their worldliness or their movies or their favorite forms of entertainment. We want to be given messages where we are patted on the back for showing up to church and living an average Laodicea and lukewarm lifestyle and that we're still on our way to heaven. And now the message is repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So when the latter rain is poured out, God's people have their sins blotted out, and then shortly after that, probation closes and Jesus comes. One last Bible verse that we need to mention, and this is Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And this shows the condition upon which God will give the Holy Spirit in the outpouring of the latter rain and in the early rain experience. Acts 5.32, which says, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Notice this. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey God. Now, you can't earn your salvation. We, under we understand that very clearly. But God doesn't pour out the Holy Spirit upon disobedient people. That's also very clear. We're saved by grace through faith, and that faith produces obedience in our lives, and God pours out the Holy Spirit upon those who obey him. So don't think that a disobedient life, a disobedient lifestyle, open rebellion to God's promises and commands will allow you to receive the outpouring of the latter rain. Scripture is very clear that the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. So let's look at a few further things here. So we're going to look at the latter rain experience, and we're going to see that the latter rain is connected to a ripened harvest at the end of the world. Now, the early rain in the Jewish economy, the early rain was the rain that came after the harvest or the seeds were initially planted that allowed the seeds to germinate and to come up out of the ground. And at the end of the harvest cycle, just before the harvest ripened, there would be another season of rain known as the latter rain that would lead to the ripening of the harvest. And so God uses that as an illustration for us to understand how the world will come to an end. And in James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, we see this concept more clearly. In James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, and here scripture says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, this is speaking of Christ, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So notice this, that in Christ waiting for the harvest, he's waiting for the early rain, which he received at Pentecost, prophetically speaking. And he's also waiting for the latter end, and he's having long patience for the precious fruit of the earth. Now, lest you think that the fruit's been ripened for a long time, and God's just trying to add more and more and more, that's not what the Bible actually teaches. Mark 4, 28 and 29 says, For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, now in the marginal reading it says, when the fruit is ripened, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. So as soon as there's a ripened harvest, the harvester immediately puts in the sickle. And Jesus is saying, I'm having long patience for my harvest until I receive the latter rain. And the latter rain has not been poured out because 
there's a few things. Number one, God's people by and large are not praying for the outpouring of the latter rain. And one of the reasons we're not praying for the outpouring of the latter rain is because many of us have enjoyed the idols of this world and we're content to be lukewarm and we refuse to be ashamed of our spiritual nakedness because most of the church is like this. And so Jesus is standing at the door knocking saying, let me come in. And we refuse to let him come in because we're okay to say he's my savior, but we don't want him to be Lord. So we're not praying for the outpouring pouring of the latter rain of Zechariah 10, 1 tells us to do. And then Jeremiah 3, verses 1 through, Cisa, 3, 1 through 3 says that the latter rain has been withheld because we've played the part of a harlot towards God. And yet he's still saying, return to me. And then Acts 3 says that we need to repent and be converted. So we as a church are lacking conversion. But when we have a, a, a repentant church and a converted church, then the times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord and the blotting out of sin will take place so that then the latter rain can be poured out, the loud cry can be given, probation will close and Jesus will come back. So when the fruit is ripened, then immediately the sickle will be thrust in by Christ, the great harvester. Now, let's go back to our slides here. So, notice the statement from Ellen White talking about the fruit. What does this fruit look like? What is the fruits of the Holy Spirit going to look like in the church? Well, Ellen White makes it clear, and she's quoting scripture. So, Galatians 5 makes it abundantly clear, and Ellen White just adds on to it. This is Christ's Object Lessons, page 68 and 69. She's quoting Galatians 5. Notice what it says. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's what a spirit-filled life looks like. Now, sometimes people get wrapped up in this idea like, oh, I'm going to have to stop sinning and I'm going to have to stop doing all these bad things. Well, actually, that's true, but you're putting it in the wrong framework. It's actually Christ comes into your life and now you have his love, you have his joy, you have his peace, his patience, his gentleness, his goodness, his faith, his meekness, and his temperance. And those fruits drive out the bad fruits from your life. And so rather than being this grumpy, legalistic grouch, which some people are in the church, you're a happy, joyful Christian full of the joy of the Lord. And you don't feel perfect because the closer you come to the Lord, the more you know what you're like when you're disconnected from him. But that's the change that takes place in your life. Then Ellen White goes on to say, this fruit can never perish, but will produce after its kind a harvest unto eternal life. And then notice this, when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest has come. That's the fruit that the church is lacking. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. And that character is described in the fruits of the Spirit. And then she goes on to say, It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel, quickly the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. So notice this, when we as a people develop the fruits of the Spirit in our hearts and our lives, when we surrender our lives to Jesus so that the Holy Spirit can be seen in our lives, so that that fruit is produced, very quickly the whole world will be sown with the seed of the gospel and Christ will come to gather the precious grain and we will be much more effective in our evangelistic efforts. Now, here's a few more statements that talk about the connection between the early rain and then the latter rain. Testimonies, Volume 8, page 21. The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the former rain, and glorious was the result. But the latter rain will be more abundant. Now, we saw this earlier. So the latter rain is going to be more abundant. And then notice Acts of the Apostles, page 55. Near the close of earth's harvest, a special bestowal of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. This outpouring of the Spirit is likened to the falling of the latter rain. So this is near the close of Earth's harvest, and we're going to see the latter rain. And then notice the statement from Great Controversy, page 464. Before the final visitations of God's judgments upon the earth, 
there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children. Now let me tell you something here. The future of Adventism is not a declension into worldliness and being more and more like the worldly churches around us and turning the church into a rock club with dancing and drums and just making the church into this modern worldly culture that we think will convert the world when in reality we as a church are being converted into the world. That's not the future of Adventism. The future of Adventism is a revival of primitive godliness that has not been witnessed since apostolic times. And that will take place when God has a people who have allowed Christ to come in so that we will have the fruits of the Spirit as we live obedient lives so that we can receive the outpouring of the latter rain. That's our future. It's not to be more like the world. It's to be like Jesus. Amen. And so let's keep looking here at some thoughts here. So the latter rain is the experience that we need. And the latter rain leads to the loud cry. Now, notice this statement from Early Writings, page 86. At that time, the latter rain, or refreshing from the presence of the Lord, will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. So notice this. The latter rain is what gives power to the loud cry or the loud voice of the third angel. So we can't give that loud cry of the third angel without, without the outpouring of the latter rain. That's what we need. We need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so so notice this, early writings, page 271. I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. It had effect. I asked what had made this great change. An angel answered, it is the latter rain the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. Now, Ellen White earlier in that passage talks about how the church was in a Laodicean state, but in other words, when Laodicea lets Christ come in, we receive the outpouring of the latter rain so that we can give the loud cry of the third angel's message. So, looking at scripture, the loud cry. Now, we've talked about the latter rain. We see that it's the outpouring of the Spirit. It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit without measure so that the fruits of the Spirit will be seen in our lives completely and we'll be, we will be empowered. So, now we look at the loud cry. In Revelation 18, verses 1 through 5 and onward is a clear description of the latter rain where we see... Um, very clearly, the Bible says, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power or great authority, and the earth was lightened or illuminated with its, his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquity. And then the message goes on from there, but that's the main thrust of the message in the first five verses. So this is a message that comes from heaven. It has great power. It has great authority. The earth is illuminated with its glory. This is the character of God that is seen throughout the world. This is not simply a proclamation of the end time message. It's a demonstration of the character of God as the end time message. And this is the experience that all of us want to be part of. Notice what Ellen White says in Testimonies, Volume 6, page 19. This is a powerful statement describing this loud cry message. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel. So that glory of God is the character of God. And again, this righteousness of Christ is going to sound from one end of the earth to the other. You know, it's one thing to preach the righteousness of Christ. It's another thing to be a demonstration of the righteousness of Christ. And one, one of the reasons that we fail as a church is that we don't actually have the righteousness of Christ. That's the Laodicean experience where we're naked spiritually, but we think we're rich and we think we have the righteousness of Christ when we really do not. When we truly have the righteousness of Christ and we're filled with the spirits, the, the, we're filled with the fruits of the spirit, then the world will see 
who Jesus really is through God's last day people. And that message needs to sound from one end of the earth to the other. Another statement, this is volume 7 of Bible Commentary, page 984. It says, As the third message swells to a loud cry, and as great power and glory attend the closing work, the faithful people of God will partake of that glory. It is the latter rain which revives and strengthens them to pass through the time of trouble. So it will be the latter rain that revives and strengthens us as a people to pass through the time of trouble, and it will empower us to give this third message with a loud cry that will attend the closing work. Volume 7 of the Testimonies, page 17. As the third angel's message swells into a loud cry, great power and glory will attend its proclamation. The faces of God's people will shine with the light of heaven. What an amazing promise that our faces will shine with the light of heaven as we give this message. And again, you know, one of the reasons why the latter rain hasn't been poured out yet is because we as a people have been full of pride thinking that we have something to bring to the table. And God isn't looking for people who think they have something to bring to the table. He is looking for people who are emptied of self that can be completely spirit-filled to demonstrate what Christ's character is truly like. Um, and I've already talked about this already, but I see ministries competing, speakers competing, and we think we're going to be part of the loud cry experience when we can't even get along here on this earth and when we're trying to step over each other to get to the top and to be the most prominent or well-known ministry right now. Come on, friends. That's not going to finish the work. It's going to be f being emptied of self, devoid of self, and filled with Christ's Spirit that will allow the work to be finished. Now, a few more statements. This is Testimonies, Volume 5, page 252. The power which stirred the people so mightily in the 1844 movement will again be revealed. The third angel's message will go forth not in whispered tones, but with a loud voice. And you know, again, sometimes I hear people saying, we don't need to be preaching our end time message in our churches. We just need to give safe messages that will make visitors feel comfortable. Friends, we're supposed to be giving this message with a loud voice, not in whispered tones. Why are we so ashamed of the very message that God has given us to give to the world? And then early writings, page 278, I saw that this message will close with power and strength, far exceeding the midnight cry. And of course, the midnight cry experience was the Millerite movement leading up to October 22, 1844. The experience of, which Ellen White says in Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, that the experience of the 10 virgins, it has been fulfilled to the very letter and it will be again. What happened to the Millerite movement will be repeated to the very letter through the second advent movement just before Jesus comes back. And the midnight cry experience is the loud cry experience for the last days. Some more statements. Letter 86, 1900. The message of the angel following the third is now to be given to all parts of the world. It is to be the harvest message, and the whole earth will be lighted with the glory of God. That's the loud cry message. It's to be the harvest message that will lighten the earth with God's glory or character. Then Testimonies, Volume 6, page 401. When the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, then will the message of the third angel swell to a loud cry and the whole earth will be lightened with the glory of the Lord. You know, we talked about the little time of trouble last week, and it's during the little time of trouble, while the persecution breaks upon the world, that this loud cry message will swell and lighten the earth with the glory of God. So while the little time of trouble is, is happening, we're going to be filled with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and with holy boldness, we're going to be giving this message with great power and glory. Not for the glory of us, but for the glory of God. And so, rather than being afraid of the trouble around us, we're going to give the message fearlessly. After the message has done its work, Ellen White does say that we'll wonder, should we have said, the, uh, said what we said the way we said it? But then we'll say, no, we have nothing to be ashamed of. We would give it again the way we gave it. Great Controversy 611, 612, I love this statement. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory, a work of worldwide extent and unwanted or, un, or power that's unlacking. Unwanted power is here foretold. Servants of God 
with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. I love this promise that servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. And it says, by thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. So wherever you are living, maybe you're watching from the Philippines or from Trinidad and Tobago or from Africa or from England or somewhere in the United States or Canada or, or Australia or somewhere else in the world, you are going to be used by God in your corner of the earth to give this last message. We're not going to rely on one or two preachers. It's going to be thousands of voices all over the earth, not one or two preachers. Now, these are some interesting statements because not everybody in the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to be receptive to this loud cry message, and you even see this happening in the church today. This first statement is from Review and Herald Extra, December 23, 1890. There is to be in the Seventh-day Adventist Churches a wonderful manifestation of the power of God, but it will not move upon those who have not humbled themselves before the Lord and opened the door of the heart by confession and repentance. In the manifestation of that power which lightens the earth with the glory of God, they will see only something which in their blindness they think dangerous, something which will arouse their fears, and they will brace themselves to resist it. Because the Lord does not work according to their ideas and expectations, they will oppose the work. Why, they say, should we not know the Spirit of God when we have been in the work so many years? Listen, friends, just because you've been in the work so many years does not mean that you will recognize the voice of the Spirit of God if you have not humbled yourself. I mean, I've even seen books published recently that attack the very message that will prepare God's people to stand through the, the end of the world. And then notice Review and Herald, May 27, 1890. The third angel's message will not be comprehended. The light which will lighten the earth with its glory will be called a false light by those who refuse to walk in, it, in its advancing glory. And so as the message advances in its glory, there will be many who will say, there's no light in this. We can't have victory over sin. We can't be made like Jesus before he comes back. This is fanaticism. This is heresy. Don't accept this version of Adventism, when in reality, this has been the version of Adventism that God has given us to us from the very beginning. But unfortunately, there's been Babylonian influences that have come into Adventism that have dumbed down the gospel to make us think that we can't have victory over sin. And so there are those in the church who are rejecting the light that is needed for this time that will prepare us to receive the outpouring of the latter rain so that we can receive the seal of God and give the loud cry message. Don't be part of that group that resists the message for this time. Testimonies, Volume 5, pages 80 and 82. This is an important statement as well. In the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged. Did you see that? Few great men will be engaged. God will work a work in our day that but few anticipate. He will raise up and exalt among us those who are taught rather by the unction of his spirit than by the outward training of scientific institutions. These facilities are not to be despised or condemned. They are ordained of God, but they can furnish only the exterior qualifications. God will manifest that he is not dependent on learned self-important mortals. And this, this is so important. Now look, I'm someone who happens to have a medical degree from Loma Linda University which is one of our higher institutions of learning in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And Ellen White says, these institutions are not to be despised, but listen, just because I have an MD next to my name doesn't make me more qualified to talk about this message than anybody else. Now, it's true that having some training and, and the study of scripture can be very helpful for explaining and giving the message, but I've seen situations, for example, where there was somewhere, somewhere in North America where there was a, an outstanding evangelist who was winning many souls to the cause, and despite that fact, his conference president wouldn't ordain him because he didn't have a master's in divinity from the seminary, and then there were pastors in that conference who weren't having any baptisms, but they were ordained because they had the degree. 
Now, again, there's nothing wrong with the degree. You can do a lot of good with that degree. But if your degree isn't leading you to win souls, you didn't fulfill the purpose for which that degree was given to you for. And so, you know, and I'll say this as well, th there's been this 2520 heresy running around that some of you may have heard about. And someone that I know was talking to an individual who believed in that idea, and they said, hey, you should listen to Norman McNulty. He gives a good explanation on this topic. And they're like, oh, there's no way I'd listen to Norman McNulty. He went to one of those higher institutions of learning, so he's been influenced by a Jesuit way of thinking, so I'm not going to listen to him. So listen, don't despise an institution just because it's an institution. Ellen White says we shouldn't despise those institutions. On the other hand, Ellen White also says in the statement very clearly that few great men will be engaged in the last solemn work and that God will work in a way in our day that but few anticipate. So listen, don't look to me, don't look to any other speaker, someone that you enjoy following. We're all human beings. You should be allowed by the grace of God to study for yourself, to see what scripture and the spirit of prophecy say, and let the Holy Spirit bring conviction to you. And he will use you, especially when that time comes. Thousands of voices throughout the world will be united to give the last message of warning to the world. And so we're not dependent upon any one person, any one school, any one institution. We're thankful for the blessings that they bestow upon the church, but we don't rely upon them. We rely upon the Holy Spirit as he fills those who humble themselves to be used by him. And so um, there was one other slide that I wanted to mention here, and this is how the loud cry leads to the second coming. We already saw this earlier, but I just want to mention this one last time as we bring this presentation to a close, that the latter rain leads to the loud cry and to the second coming, where Peter is giving this sermon at Pentecost, but he's describing what's going to happen at the end of the world. Acts 3, 19 and 20, he says, repent ye therefore and be converted. There's the experience of repentance, that your sins may be blotted out. That happens at the end of the world in the cleansing of the sanctuary. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So when the sins of God's people are blotted out, then the Holy Spirit is poured out in the latter rain experience. Now this happens in the parable of the ten virgins. When the midnight cry is given, that's the loud cry, that's the Sunday law experience. We saw that in our first presentation. And the wise virgins who have the early rain experience, they have the extra oil in their vessels with their lamps, they now receive the outpouring of the latter rain to give the loud cry message. And then a short time later, the door closes as they go in with the bridegroom to the marriage and the door shuts. That's the closer probation. Then Jesus comes after that. It says, then he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. And of course, the latter rain leads to the ripening of the harvest. And Revelation 14 is a description of the great harvest at the time of the second coming of Jesus. And you see Christ sitting on a cloud and he has a sickle in his hand and he thrusts it into the earth because the harvest of the earth is ripe. So friends, we have a special message for a special time at this time of earth's history. We want to be ready for Jesus to come. Jesus is coming very soon. And he wants to pour out the Holy Spirit upon us in the form of the latter rain. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him, to those who repent, to those who turn away from the idols of this world and who return to Christ and who allow Jesus to come in he's, as he's knocking on the door of our heart. Let's stop glorying in the shame of our nakedness as a church. Let's accept Christ and his righteousness for all that it truly is, which includes the fruits of the Spirit. It includes the character of Jesus. And by grace through faith, we can receive all of those blessings so that we will be fitted for the outpouring of the latter rain so that we can give the loud cry because I believe the Sunday law is coming soon. I believe the end is coming soon. And we need to be prepared for that final crisis. And we need to be fitted with the character of Jesus to face that time. So let's be ready. Let's be faithful and may Jesus come soon. So let's close now with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for being with us today. I pray that we would be obedient, that we would be surrendered, that we would be repentant, and that you would fill our lives with your spirit, and that we would be prepared to receive the outpouring of the latter rain. We know Ellen White has made the statement that the latter rain may be falling all around us and we may not even be aware of its outpouring. That May that not be our experience. May we be the ones who receive that outpouring and may we be found faithful when you come. I pray this 
In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. Next week, we are going to focus on what events will be surrounding the death decree as that leads to the end of all things. So we're going to look at the death decree. And again, remember to send your questions to contact at audioverse.org. Blessings to you, and we'll see you next week.